Hopefully that was enough time to get you to Acts chapter 2. I want you to bounce down to verse 42. And in verse 42, we begin reading, and it says this, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayer. That's, those are the main things. When you, when you look at the main things, those were the things that the early church focused their attention on. Those were the things that were critically important to the body of Christ at that time. And, and if you look at that, they continued in doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread and of prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and they had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, and every man that, as every man had a need. And they continued daily with one accord. Wouldn't that be an amazing thought? That, that, that the church would be one, in one accord. It, it wasn't one sect versus that sect. It wasn't one denomination versus that denomination. Wouldn't it be nice if we would just keep the main thing the main thing again? And so if we look at the main thing being the main thing, he said, let's, let's do this in unity. Let's do this in a position of one accord in the temple. And breaking of bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They considered their heart. They considered what was going on. And the Bible goes on to say, praising God and having favor with all the people. Do you realize that when the church is, is doing right, everybody gets blessed? When the church is doing right, everyone gets blessed. Say everyone gets blessed. Everyone gets blessed. And the Bible says, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You know, sometimes what we do as pastors is we commission our people to go out into the highways and byways and compel people to come in. When in reality, if we're living right and we're doing right and we're acting right and we're keeping the main thing the main thing, do you realize that people are drawn to you? There's a drawing that happens. There is a, there is a who are you and why are you so happy? There is the, the response that people give to you and they look at you and they say, I know what's going on in your life. Why, is every, why, are you, why are you not more upset? Why aren't you more distracted? Why aren't you more frustrated? Why aren't you sad? Why aren't you worried? And, and, and because we keep the main thing the main thing, what we find is in this particular passage, God magnifies and grows the church. We think we got to invite 17 people and hand out our guest cards. I've got mine in my pocket right there. You know, I'm, I'm handing them out as regular as I could be. I was handing them out in Tulsa. I carried them with me all the way to Tulsa. But, I, but, but the reality is, is me handing someone a card pales in comparison to me living a life that has kept the main thing the main thing. And that's living my life in reflection of who Jesus is. This early church was impacted as a result. But let me ask you this question as we move into our sermon. Why are we get so easily distracted? Why, are we, why do we get so disjointed from time to time in our lives? How many of you know? How many of you know our jobs can be a distraction? Our kids can be a distraction. Our grandkids can be a distraction. You know, uh, our sleep can be a distraction. I heard one time somebody say, I was talking to a pastor. The guy averages like three and a half to four hours a night of sleep. I, I don't function well on that. You would not like me if I did three and a half to four hours. I said, Why? How do you do that? He said, uh, He said, He said, I'll be, I'll be totally refreshed. He said, When I, when I'm dead. He said, I get a fresh body, I get a fresh life, I get a fresh... He said, I'm going to expel this body for everything I've got. And I thought to him, I told him, I said, no, wait a minute. Mark Buntain, the great missionary that opened up, he opened up uh, 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 India, he made a statement near the end of his life. He said, if I, he said, I could have extended my ministry 10 years if I'd just taken care of my body. So we've got we've to be wise, but we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. What's distracting you right now from keeping the main thing the main thing? Is it your career, your business, your kids, your grandkids, your finances? I know people get focused on finances. Their projects, their endeavors. The, they're, 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 there's always something that maintains our distraction or motivates our distraction in life. 
So I'm going to help you refocus. I'm going to do a little uh, an example real quick just to help you refocus real quickly so that we're all on page together. When I say the following statement, what comes to mind? Because I'm just going to help you refocus for just a minute. You think this is going to be a big, everybody ready for a big moment? All right, I say this, the golden arches. What am I talking about? McDonald's, guess what? All of you got focused real quick. Just like that, right? How, how about if I say this? You can have it your way. Burger King. All right, this is not spiritual. I'm giving you a lesson. I'm giving you a lesson on how to refocus and stop being distracted for just a moment. How about this? That's finger licking good. Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC. How about this? You're in good hands. All state. There you go. How about just do it? Nike, and how about this last one? It's football time in, and what are we talking about? The Tennessee Vols. Now, some of y'all might be Alabama fans, and I, under, you know, whatever. I, I think you lost yesterday, didn't you, Alabama fans? And, no, did they win? All right, just, just checking. But each one of those statements are so simple, but it's amazing how quickly they refocus us. What are the things that you have to build into your life that will help you refocus on who you are and who God is in your life. See, I was thinking about this this morning, that every one of those statements, although simple and short, they represent and illustrate a meaning of something far greater. Those little phrases represent something way bigger. You know, in the church, there are things that we, that we use, uh, that, 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 that we repetitively do, that help us or are symbolic of established truths in the Word. And, and, and they're, 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 they help us to, to no longer be distracted, but they help us to maintain focus. And there's practices that we do in the church. There are repetitive things that we do in the church that help us regain our center. How many of you, you know what I mean when I say that? We, we refocus ourselves. We, we, re, we regenerate ourselves. And one of those areas is the communion table. Did everybody get a communion cup when they walked in? If you did not get one, raise your hand. I've got ushers, and they'll get you one. Just put your hand up. If you did not get one, we're going to get you one right now while I'm just doing this little simple introduction, and uh, John will take care of you. Thank you so much, John, for doing that. But communion is one of the most significant things of the church because it represents the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. So when we start thinking about keeping the main thing the main thing, most of the time what we do is we allow the communion supper to become an afterthought in a service rather than a main thing. When in reality, you look at the early church, they did it with regularity. The Bible says they did eat their meat. and The Bible says that they broke bread together daily. Now, some churches have developed doctrinal beliefs or traditions of doing communion every time they come together. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but, but what happens is, is I want to focus on the communion and what it means to you and I today in keeping communion the main, one of the main things in our life. See, if I keep communion one of the main things in my life, what I realize is it, it, it was a staple in the New Testament church. It was something that they did repetitively. It was, some, it was an action that they held with great honor. Today, what we would call is that we would call it a sacrament. We would call it a religious ritual. We would call it something of, uh, something of special significance. It has a sacred meaning in context of, of a religious tradition. But we don't talk like that. What Jesus did in all simplicity is he took something that was very simple gave it meaning so that we would remember. Can you imagine having bread and, and, and wine the first time after Jesus' death? Can you imagine what it must have been like for those 12 disciples as they were having conversation over dinner? They were, they, Jesus had died. He'd, he'd be born, he, he, he rose again, and out of that raising again, he stays on the earth. He walks with them. He talks with them. He has communication, and he ascends unto heaven. Can you imagine when the dust began to settle, and they sat down for dinner, and they sat down for dinner, and they broke bread? Can you imagine what went through their mind at that moment? 
all that he said would happen happened. All that he did came true. Can you imagine that bread? Man, that bread tasted better than it ever tasted before. Can you imagine that wine at that moment? Jesus, there was something you did for me. You shed your blood. You told us you would, and we didn't even see it. We didn't even understand it. But, but we, we, we now partake, and I mean, almost with trembling, I can imagine that first cup thinking about it. We don't do that anymore. We pop the top, we pop the bottom, throw it back, and we go home. Praise the Lord. Let me get to the pot roast at home. But we don't with, with trembling and with, with honor and respect because of all the other distractions in our life. See, see, for believers, communion shouldn't be just a distracted time, but an intimate time of fellowship with the Lord. It should be an intimate time, not a distraction, not a, hey, we got to get through this. Oh, man, just, uh, no, I'm not going to take. No, it's, it's something that we should maintain with regularity. By faith, all of the spiritual and physical blessings that we have today come through the redemptive work of Christ. We eat that cracker, and all of a sudden that cracker, that that broken body now says there's more for me than, it's not just this wafer that, doesn't taste very good or could be stale from time to time. Some of y'all have thought. You've put that in your mouth. You went, yeah, this is a stale cracker. Immediately you've left the Holy of Holies at that point because we don't, we don't see the communion supper as being so important. We must not get distracted and treat communion as common or routine or something that is, I don't want to say worthless, but less worth than the things that are going on in our lives. It's not simply a meal or even a snack. You know, but rather it's a time to remember what Christ has done for us. Did you know that the, that the, that the New Testament church in, in, in Corinth the Bible says that Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 34, he made this statement. He said, if you're hungry, eat before you get here. They, there was po- folks coming to the communion supper going, well, praise God, at least I got something to drink and something to eat. With no understanding of what was fixing to take place. And see, I think sometimes what happens in our lives is, is, is we, Jesus just used these ordinary things and he, he created this extraordinary moment out of bread and out of wine. Now, now I was thinking as I was, as this, this common bread, again, I can't imagine that dinner table when the guys all got together and they're talking about what they just saw. They're talking about that day's ministry, and they're talking about tomorrow's ministry. And and as they're talking about this ministry that is happening, dinner gets served. And they all remember what that last meal was like. Now, the interesting thing is, is that Jesus talked about bread and wine all the time in his ministry, but they never got it till probably when he was gone. See, early on in the early books of, in John, I think it's John chapter 6. Can you throw that up there for me, Miss Hannah, the next verse? John chapter 6, verse 48. I want to read this. He says this, I am the bread of life. Do you know when this passage was written? It was written so much earlier. It wasn't even close to this moment of the final day. It wasn't one of these moments. But he is setting the tone over the course of his ministry to give an example for that Passover meal. And so when he gets there, this is not something that should be foreign, but they still don't get it until he's gone. He says, I'm the bread of life. He says, uh, verse number 48, and, 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 and he says, I am the bread of life. Verse 49, he says this. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Keep going. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that, the man, that, that a man may eat thereof and not die. Keep going. And there's power in that bread. There's power in that life-giving bread. He says, I am the living bread. Say living bread. 
He says, I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. It's clicking now on that dinner ta- at that dinner table meeting. He talked about this a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, and it's now making sense. The next one. Is that the last one? There we go. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I think that's my last verse. Nope. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Now, out of this story, out of this story, I'm going to keep going. Out of this story, a conversation happens about five or six verses later. The disciples come to him after this conversation, and they say to him, they say, they say, Master, this is a hard message. They were upset at this morbidity of thought. You're going to eat me. You're going to drink me. And they're thinking, you, you can't say that, Pastor. Some people are not receiving of that. And you know what Jesus said to them? Are you going to leave too? He didn't change the thought or the process of the understanding of this communion supper. And because of that, the Bible tells us in the f- verse 54 and 56, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Man, in today's environment, this is just a sick thought. If you saw it on the news, church drinks blood. Can you imagine how many people would be on our doorstep picketing? How many of us would be threatened with a lawsuit? That's what Jesus was talking about there. But he said, guys, I'm I'm setting the tone for that Passover dinner. That I'm going to give you something to remember me by. You're not going to have to actually eat my flesh and drink my blood. But I'm going to give you something that you'll never forget. Can you imagine drinking that last cup? I just... Just in my mind, I'm shaking just thinking about it. As as they partook of that drink together. See, it's not a one and done proposition, church. It must become something that we keep as a main thing in our lives. The communion element has to become something so so, so significant. The Lord's Supper is more than just a glass of juice and a Ritz cracker but rather a lifestyle of obedience to Christ's command. It's so much more than than this little K-cup that we've just become so accustomed to using and so simple to throw away. Do we reverence this? For some reason, when we put it in a tray and we got to pick it out and we pull the glass, there's something significant that says that's more important than this And when ultimately it's not, the, it's not the chalice by which we hand it to you. It's the elements that represent it inside. See, for believers, it should become second nature to be willing to do what he says. If we're not careful, we can get distracted, number one. Communion is an acceptance of obedience. See, when I, when I accept communion, when I, when I accept it, I accept it as part of obedience. But you know what? Did you know that distraction can keep you from obeying? Distractions can keep you from obeying the will of God. We can, we can do good things, but they might not be God things. We can get busy doing things that, that, that seem good. One of the fights I have as a pastor is not doing everything all y'all want to do. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, I have to stop and I have to ask God, God, what do you want us to do? But, but we have to walk in this thing. This communion is an acceptance of obedience. The Bible says in Luke twenty two nineteen. 19, It says this, he took some bread and he gave thanks to to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He didn't say if you feel like it. He didn't say when it's convenient. He didn't necessarily say do it on the first Sunday of every month. He did it in a way that said 
do this in remembrance of me, that first dinner. Can, there, can you imagine how quiet that table must have got when that bro- bread got broken for the first time? And they're all looking at him, and they're, and, and they're, and they're, they're looking at him, and they're going, he did that. Wow. How quickly, how quickly do we get back to that place of remembrance? Do this in remembrance. It, it says it also in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Do this in remembrance of me. Both of those passages, they, they, they have explicit instructions by Jesus to do this in remembrance. Now, obedience in these days has a tendency to be completely circumstantial in our lives. What I'm obeying, you might look at me and say, well, that's what God's called you to do, but he ain't called me to do it. You know, the neat thing is, is if I give you the word, you can't argue with me. You have to argue with the author of the book. And, and it's interesting, Jesus made a statement in, 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 in John chapter 15. He said this, you are my friends if you obey me. You know, we sing a song, I am a friend of God. I can't remember how the rest of it goes. I just remember that part. Is that about it? But the problem is, is we sing that song as as an anthem, as a triumph. But you know what? If we're not obeying God, we're not his friend. We're not his friend. So, so if I understand that there's an awareness of obedience in the communion supper, then all of a sudden the communion supper becomes more important to me. Jesus considered it an act of obedience and friendship if you did what he said. Obedience is an awareness of love and submission and walking by the Spirit. The second thing I want to share with you this morning is this. Communion is an activity of examination and remembrance. But if I'm, not caref- too care- if I'm not careful, I can get distracted from the activity of self-examination and the activity of remembering who he is. See, if I, it, it, communion is, is an ex- example of this, this element, this element that we call examination. It's more than an examination of ourselves, but a remembrance of what Christ did. As believers, we are encouraged to examine our heart as we prepare to receive communion. In the next few moments, I want to challenge you with a couple of thoughts under this subject matter of, 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 of examination and remembrance. Number one, when we are distracted, we won't consider our heart. When, when we don't properly examine our heart, when we don't properly understand the, the, the examination and the remembrance of what is, we have to consider our hearts. We must approach communion with a reverence, not a flippant attitude. And, and because we tend to throw it at the back of a service or we throw it in the middle of a worship set and, and we, we give it three to ten minutes of our time, we don't ever stop and keep it a main thing. So I'm just choosing this morning to keep communion the main thing. Because if I don't keep it the main thing, I'm not going to challenge you that your hearts, where is your heart right now? The Bible says that we are supposed to examine our hearts. Let's be honest, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This week, none of us lived a perfect life. This week, none of us thought perfectly. This week, none of us reacted perfectly. This week, none of us, not a single one of us can go with 100% in this. The Bible tells me in the book of uh, 1 John 1, 9, I'm going to read out of the message translation because I just love it. It rocked my world when I read it this way. It says, if we claim that we're free of sin, we're only fooling ourselves. A claim like that is errant nonsense. On the other hand, if we admit our sins, simply come clean about them, he won't let us down. He'll be true to himself. He'll forgive our sins and purge us of all wrongdoing. The Bible says that he puts us back into this position of righteousness. And don't you love when you can go to another passage and says it says he doesn't remember that sin any longer? He says he throws that sin as far as the east is from the west, and he says, hey, guess what? You could go to him five minutes later and say, God, you remember when we were talking about this? And you go, what were we talking about? 
It's not because he's ignorant and stupid. It's because his love for you is so great. He chooses to erase that from you because of the what blood, the blood and the and the broken body of Jesus Christ. See, we we don't ever consider, we don't consider our hearts. How about we consider if we're not careful? And we get distracted, we won't consider the significance and the importance of discerning the Lord's body. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, Therefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. What are we talking about? More than just the elements of bread and juice, communion shouldn't just bring us into a relationship with Jesus, but it should also move us into a place of closer fellowship with him. Not just with him, but with each other. Do you realize that when we eat eat this bread and drink this cup, what we're doing is we're discerning what Christ did. So our relationship with him gets better. And, and, and we begin to evaluate and we begin to, to consider and remember what he did for us and, and the value and the worth of this. But you know what he said? He said not only does that affect the body and the blood, the representation, but guess what it says? It says, I, I need to discern whether or not I'm treating you right. I need to determine whether or not I'm in right relationship, not just vertically, but horizontally as well. You know, the Bible tells me that if we're not careful, this unworthily, this irreverently, this doubting, this this discerning of doubting, judging, and and being partial to, I have to understand that that, that there's a fellowship of believers that I have to be careful of. So I have to ask myself this question, how am I treating you? How are you treating me? How are you treating that person sitting next to you? This is a great moment and great time of reflection. Parents, how are you relating to your kids? Kids, how are you relating to your parents? Spouse, relating to spouse. Family with family, friend with friend. Because you realize this, they're part of the Lord's body. Nancy is part of the Lord's body. Chris is part of the Lord's body. Miss Brenda is part of the Lord's body. Miss Shirley is part of the Lord's body. And how do I relate to the Lord's body? I can drink this, but, it, but, but all I'm doing is, is I'm considering the one that is no longer here. But the Bible tells me in another passage, how can you love that which you've not seen if you love that which you... Do you follow? I think I got that wrong. How can you love that which you've not seen, but you can't love that which you have seen? we got to keep the main thing the main thing, church. Paul felt so strongly about the need to worthily discern the body that he told the Corinthian believers that their neglect in this area was why many people were sick and even died. 1 Corinthians 10 says this, The cup of blessing which we bless... It is not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that bread. He, he, just, he just engrafts all of us into that conversation in that verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, aren't we partaking of this together? Aren't we partaking of this in fellowship? Aren't we partaking of this as as part of the body of Christ? See, when we discern, we place value on people. When I discern Alex, when, when I discern Brandy, I'm placing value on them. When we discern the Lord's body, we are to pay attention to the spiritual as well as the natural body of Christ. If you're in wrong standing, we'll pop these things back, throw them back like we're sitting at a bar, not even thinking about the person that we've offended. Right? We'll, we'll, we'll take these and we'll not even consider the people that we might be in offense with. Now, the Bible does tell me that we're supposed to live at peace with all men. I preached on Wednesday night. The goal of our lives is to, to live this life in relationship with one another as best we can. Uh, one day, the Duke of Wellington, I came across this illustration. He was, he was at the communion table, the Duke of Wellington. Now, consider that position. He was, and, and there was an old, extremely poor man taking a seat beside him. 
An usher was about to have him leave, but the duke, sensing what was going on, grasped the elderly gentleman's hand and whispered, don't you move, friend. We are all equal at this table. We don't move people once they've been seated. If we do, we're not discerning the Lord's body. What I understand and know in the Bible, it tells me this. It says, when you stand praying, forgive. And if you have ought against any, uh, that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. It's critically important that we not only be right with God, but we be right with man. Maybe before we partake, maybe there's a husband and spouse need to look at each other and just simply say, I'm sorry. You can deal with the details later, but... But if we'll just simply do that, we're discerning the body. We have to consider what Jesus gave us. If we're not careful, if we're not careful, what we'll do is we'll get distracted and, and, and we won't consider what Jesus gave us. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, it says he gave us a new testament in his blood. This new covenant, this new agreement, this new ability to walk in who he is in the Bible, the new covenant, the blood covenant was the most sacred binding covenant that could have been given to man. So as we get to this place in our service, the third thing I want you to understand is this. Communion encourages the action of forgiveness. How do I forgive you? How do you forgive me? How do I ask God to put me in right standing with him? How do we live in a life that says, how, how does the blood and the death of Christ represent the life that we have? The blood meant life. This washing of the water of the word produced something in us. E.W. Kenyon is one of my favorite authors of all time, and I want to read a, an illustration. He said this, When you see the work of grace, the death of the old man, and the putting away of the old sin nature, you know that Jesus has forgiven all your sins and he has remitted them. What does that word remission mean? What, that, what does that word mean? It means that they are canceled of a debt, the charge of a penalty. It's the revocation and the repeal, just as if it never happened. So when we look at this illustration, it says, you know what, Jesus has forgiven our sins and he has remitted them. God the Father says, I remember your sins no more. That is remission. He is not making your sins against, marking your sins against you. Remission is the absolute blotting out of all sin. It is as if that, is as if, it is as if that has never existed. The problem is, as we think about the sin that he doesn't even consider existing. See, when we consider communion, communion should have a little bit more of an importance in our lives now. He's forgiven us. He's washed us clean. He's made us whole. The Bible says, for I, for I will be merciful to the unrighteous and their sins and their iniquities. I will remember no more. Hebrews 8.12. It says in Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it, took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. As we get ready to close, can I have the worship team come? The little things that have minimal meaning to so many, talking about the bread and the cup. When you look at this, this doesn't mean anything to so many. It's, it's worthless. It's just a, it's just a drink, and, it, and it's, just a, it's, just a, it's just a cracker. To so many, it doesn't mean anything. But, but, but it becomes significant within the hands of those who understand its worth and its value. It's not just something that we do irreverently. It's something that we do with great reverence. You see, one of the greatest illustrations that we have is that, that we ratify agreements with a signature today. But God was so, God felt it was so important that he ratified his agreement with you and with me by his blood. There's no greater ratification than by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. But as I begin to close this morning, there's something that I want you to do. You may be that person that has said, you know what, I've not considered 
the action of forgiveness, both for myself in simply saying, God, forgive me, or me in the action of asking for forgiveness from another, or me communicating to someone, I forgive you. But in this last thought that I have for you this morning, we're going to get ready to sing. And as we sing a final song, there's one part of the communion supper that we often neglect. Normally we say the sinner's prayer, and as long as you're, uh, you've asked Jesus into your heart, partake. It's great. No problem. No harm. No foul. It's great. It's wonderful. But there's something that happens through the communion supper that is even bigger than, than that in, in, terms of, in terms of our present day life. And that is the communion provides an activation for healing. See, what Christ did on the cross was His brokenness was to give you and I wholeness. And, and so often, we, because we don't necessarily remember that aspect of it, we forget that part. See, not only was the spiritual healing available through communion, but healing also in the physical and emotional parts of our being. See, discerning the Lord's body also means to understand that Christ's body was broken of its physical health for our well-being. It's a belief that we have as a cardinal belief of our fellowship. I want you to stand up for just a moment. When we discern the Lord's body, when we understand the value and the purpose of this, this, this simple little thing that Jesus said, hey, I am the bread. And they're thinking, yeah, cool. It wasn't until after he left that that bread meant something. It, it, oh, I, I, am, I am the blood. Oh, that's kind of gross, Pastor. But afterwards, they thought about it. See, this whole purpose of why we're doing this is you understand that Jesus broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. He was symbolizing that his body would be broken on Calvary for the removal of sickness and disease. The blood of the Passover lamb in Exodus chapter 12 also was a form of protection. The Bible tells me in Psalms, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgiveth thine iniquities and who healeth all thy diseases. First Peter says this, who, is, who his own self bear our sins on his own body on the tree, that he, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Matthew 8 says this, that it might be fulfilled, which was broken, spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and he bare our sicknesses. Before we partake of the Lord's Supper, some of you have come this morning and you need one of those provisions I talked about this morning. And I want to do something just a little bit different. If there's healing needed in your body, I want you to come up. If, if there's a, 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 a sincere longing in your heart to be forgiven, I want you to come up. I want you to bring your K-cup with you. Because I want you to partake in a moment of complete reverence for who God is and what He's done. So, so, so you might think, well, I don't need to go forward. No, you might have to come forward simply because I want you to consider the action of forgiveness that took place in your life. I want you to come forward for the action of healing to take place in your life. I want you to come forward for the activity of examination and, and remembrance and, and simply out of obedience to say, God, I want to partake with you. I don't want to partake with my spouse. I don't want to partake with my kids. I don't want to partake with my friends. I want you to go ahead and come. Because we're going to sing a song, and then we're going to all partake together at the end. But I don't know why you come. So just come on up. Just come on up for whatever reason that might be. Would you lead us in a song? Hallelujah. Let's sing. sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you. So oh. 
deep It's more than I can stand I'm melting in your peace It's overwhelming I want to sit I want to sit at your feet Drink from the cup in your hand Lay back against you and breathe Feel your Some have come forward because they want to partake of healing. Some have come forward because they want to partake of forgiveness. Some have come forward, Heavenly Father, because they just want to activate their faith in self-examination and remembrance. Some of them have come forward just simply to say, God, I want to be obedient to you. So, Father, as we're getting ready to partake, Father, we partake of this bread first. And God, I thank you right now for each person here. Go ahead and get your cup ready. I want, you to, I want you to take that bread in your hand. And I want you to recognize that what he did for you, the supernatural power of communion manifests and can bring healing to our bodies. It can bring healing to our minds. It can activate forgiveness at a level that we can't do in our natural capacity. So God, I, I thank you, Lord, for this, this cracker. I thank you, Lord, that it represents far more than the combination of bread and yeast and whatever it's else is in there. But God, it represents the word that says if that we will eat of your bread, we will have eternal life. If we will eat of this bread, we'll have wholeness and completeness. If we'll eat of this bread, God, Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you as we partake of this bread together. Father, let there be no sin in our lives. Let there be no, let there be no action or attitude. Let there be no agenda in our lives, God, that would be contrary of you. Because, God, we long to discern your body and your blood. We long to discern the body of Christ. We long, Father, that this means something more than just being a cracker. That may not taste that good. Father, it's the partaking of our Savior. It's the remembering and the examining and the, and the condition of our heart, God. Father, we partake of it. And as we partake of it, God, this morning, I believe that if a person needs healing, God, you will activate that healing power supernaturally in their body. Every pain has to go in Jesus' name. Father, every issue that is in that physical body, God, we claim it to go in Jesus' name. God, we thank you, Lord, that limbs and legs and backs and arms, God, I believe that as we partake, healing will manifest in our mind. God, where we have been consumed in our mind and our emotions have gotten the best of us, God, we take a moment right now and we just simply recall and remember the power that is this, this representation of this bread means. God, I want to keep the main thing the main thing. So, Father, we partake of this together right now in Jesus' name. Receive your healing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As you take the top off the juice side, be careful. As you get ready to partake of that, we understand that his blood was shed for us on Calvary. 
And that blood, if we're in this place and, and we need forgiveness and we need remission of sin, God, I'm asking you right now, forgive me of sin. Lord, let that be the prayer of every person in this room. God, forgive us of sin. Forgive us of wrong thinking and wrong thoughts. Forgive us of wrong actions and attitudes. God, I pray right now, God, that you would wash us once again clean as we partake of this, this drink. God, I believe, Lord, that there is the ability to take me and my dirty self and wash me white as clean. And God, I thank you, Lord, that as we partake together, Lord, that, that fresh feeling, that fresh feeling overwhelms us in such a special way. God, we thank you for this blood right now, this juice in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we receive all that you have done for us on Calvary. God, we, we don't just toss aside and make this an irreverent part of a service, but God, we focus on communion as being the main thing this morning. Help us to no longer be distracted from the issues of life as we consider what you did on Calvary. Father, there might be one person in this place, Heavenly Father, that, that doesn't know you as their Lord and personal Savior. I pray that before they leave this place, they will accept Christ and simply say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. Hallelujah. There might be a person in this room that hasn't experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit. If that's you, I want to pray with you. But before we leave, I want to leave with a shout because I believe, I believe when we partake of communion, we don't have to tremble anymore, but we can declare what God has done. Amen. And what has he done through his death, his burial and his resurrection, through his blood and his body? We have a life that we did not have before. How many of you know that's worthy of a hallelujah? On the count of three, let's shout hallelujah. One two, three, hallelujah. God bless you.